Hashem, whatever he tells us, does himself. And any negative commandment, he also abides by. He does not violate any of the negative commandments. There's a question about how he keeps Shabbos when he makes it rain. That's a, that discussion that uh, the Gemara talks about. But I'm going to ask the question that the Rebbe addresses. How is Hashem allowed to destroy the Beis HaMikdash? You know, if we're not worthy of it, it's made from us. If we're not worthy of it, we don't have to destroy it. Um, to be put into hiding, restricted, like the Mishkan. We don't know where the Mishkan is. It wasn't destroyed. But Maitre Rabbeinu built with his hands. His handiwork never was destroyed. Why did Hashem destroy the Beis Hamikdash? He's violating two laws. Baal Tashchis, you now ought to be destructive. You can't destroy things. Number two, there's also a violation of destroying something that's holy. In addition to general Baal Tashchis, Baal Tashchis means do not be destructive. Uh, knocking down trees would be an example. Or just not being careful with uh, with items that are value and just throwing it away. That's Baal Tashchis. You're not allowed to do that. Unless there's a purpose for it. That's one of Aira. And then the other sin, apparently, is to says Lo Sa Sun Kain. What you do to idol worshiping, to, to, you know, to idols or to houses of worship. You're supposed to destroy those houses of worship, non-Jewish houses of worship. But you see in Eretz Israel, any kind of tree that's that's, that's worshipped. But Lo Sa Sun Kain La Hashem location, do not do such. To the structure of the holy structure of the Mishkan or the tabernacle, which would also include the Beis Hamikdash, obviously. And yet Hashem destroyed the Beis Hamikdash. That's the question. The first question can be easily answered. One does not violate Baal Tashkis, do not destroy. If you're doing it for a purpose, what will be the purpose? For example, if a person wants to discipline his class, and the only thing that works is scaring them. He takes something that he has in his hand and he breaks it, and the kids get scared. So although he's breaking the item, but he's at least affecting the children, getting them to behave. So that would be a positive. And then you're not violating the prohibition of do not destroy. You're not being destructive. You're actually being constructive. But that's not going to answer the second question. The second question, you cannot destroy. Uh, what? I can't hear you. What's the purpose of destroying the Oh, you're right. <clears throat> Likewise, destroying the Beis Amigdosh says that Hashem, by destroying the Beis Amigdosh, he vented his anger on the sticks and stones and not on us. Back is a chapter in Tilim, chapter 79, which talks about the destruction of the temple, the Beis Amigdosh, and it says, Mizmor, it's a song. What's the song? It should have said lamentation, kina le'asa. It says mismar le'asa. And it talks all about the korban. The answer is, thank God for the korban that we were saved. Well, Hashem could have vented his anger on, on us, and instead it was only on the actual stones of the Beis Hamikdash. Okay, so that's a Ellis, like a benefit. Venting your anger on the Beis uh, Dosh and not on the Jews. But that does not answer the second question. You cannot destroy, take down a shul for an outside cause. I take down the shul on the, uh, for what purpose? We'll build a mikvah instead or something. Can't do that. Or for some other mitzvah. You're not allowed to take down a shul, certainly destroy a shul for another reason. The only way you can knock down a shul is if you're going to rebuild the same shul in that same location and renovate it, make it look nicer. But it can't, you can't use a side, a side benefit. That will help Baltas because it won't help with this. So how is Allah, Hashem allowed to do that? So we'll answer that question on Thursday. Now, halacha. let's first go to halacha, then we'll get to the mimer. I also have a question to ask how the parsha of this week is connected to our mimer. That I'll ask in a minute. But before we get, not in a minute, but in a few minutes.
Let's first go through some of the halachas of the nine days, which we didn't cover yet. Um, so number one, it's forbidden to purchase silverware and other expensive household appliances or nice furniture during the nine days. The same applies to a car, a washing machine, dryer, or the like. Unless there's an absolute need for it, you can't get along without it. If you need a car, you can't go to work. Uh, so you're not buying it just for pleasure, you're buying it for an, it's an absolute necessity. If it's not for an absolute necessity, all these appliances should not be bought. Okay. Obviously, uh, an air conditioner uh, uh, you know, in this weather would be a necessity. You can't live without it. So, in fact, even on Shabbos, you're allowed to into a goy to put on an AC, which I just did this past Shabbos, because it went off, the thermostat wasn't working. So I had to hint to the non-Jew to flick a switch and turn it on. Why? Because it's like a case for a sick person. Somebody is sick, then we're a lot, we're much more lenient with the laws of do not tell a non-Jew to do a malacca for you. So everyone's considered sick when it comes to hot weather or cold weather. Akoil choilu matzlo. We, no one can tolerate extreme heat, you sleep a whole night without the AC in this weather, or vice versa, when it's very cold, they sleep in the cold. So you're considered equal to a sick person. And for a sick person, we're make or much more lenient. Some even say you could actually tell the guy directly to do it, not only through hinting, if he doesn't get catch the hint. Sometimes hard to hint because you have to pinpoint to it. You know, you gotta, you gotta know which, which button to, you know, to, to, it wasn't easy. Um, so that's that. Let's go to the next level. Um, if someone purchases a new pair, a new piece of furniture before Rosh Chodesh Av, like today, before the arrival of the month of Av, uh, they should bring it into the house. So, so in other words, like this: if it, you purchase the furniture before uh, before Rosh Chodesh, before the nine days began, it arrived in the nine days. So they shouldn't bring it into the house, or at least shouldn't use it. They can't avoid that. Do not use it until the 10th day of Av, after Chatzos. In this case, it's already the 10th day of Av on Sunday. The fast day is already the 10th day of Av, so you don't have to wait till the next day until Chatzos, just until, until the fast is over. You could already use it. So if it was purchased before, but it arrived during the nine days, it's not a necessity. You can wait until after Tisha B'Av. New clothing and shoe purchase are not permitted during the nine days. <clears throat> Even if it will cause somewhat of a financial loss. Unlike the three weeks, we're more lenient. Nine days, buying something new, unless it's an extreme financial loss, there's an amazing sale for one time, and it's mamish, a very, very uh, expensive item that you need, and you can't get it. At a price they're gonna, uh, and it won't be available later on. So then that's a different story. But if it's just a a a, a, a uh, moderate financial loss, you have to take that loss. Okay. Now, mitzvah articles to purchase fill in the nine days. I know you're not you want to do that for yourself. To purchase fill in the nine days is okay, even on Tisha B'Av, uh, you can purchase fill in. But a talus, no. But a talus is considered like clothing, even though it's a mitzvah item. It, a talus cannot be purchased unless you don't have what to wear. You have no, you don't have a talus of your own. Um, you can purchase a new yarmulke for an up Sharonish boy who turns three during the nine days. You may you can even purchase sneakers, obviously, for uh, whatever you're allowed to wear during, you know, instead of shoes, sandals or whatever it is, crocs. You can buy that even on Tisha B'Av. It's not a problem. So it's for Tisha B'Av. Uh, you can buy a yarmulke for a kid, his birthday, yeah, yeah. So it's possible that if you do it earlier, better do it earlier, but if you couldn't do it earlier, you can do it even during the nine days. Um, okay, you don't make any reno renovations in your home if it's not an absolute need, if, you can, if it's livable without these renovations. Painting, likewise, if it's not something you need to paint it because the house, the walls are falling apart, you want to just paint to make it look nicer, nicer color, that you should not do during the nine days. Um, building restrictions apply even with non-Jewish con contractors and workers. However, if you contract the worker, you started the guy, you know, you started hiring him before Rosh Chodesh, 
with an open date, you didn't tell him when he has to finish. In fact, you said you can finish anytime you want, you know, even after the nine days. You didn't give him a, a limit. So then you're allowed to let him work. What's so funny? Huh? Yes, yes, no. huh? No. What? Yes, no. What? Yes, no. Okay, why is that funny? I don't know. Um, so, yeah, so again, if you had a contract with an Andrew to paint your house um, before, you try to offer a compensation that you should not have to work on the nine days. If it doesn't work, then you're allowed to let them work. A Jew who's liable that you're a contractor, you're a builder, that's what you do for your Parnassah. So you're allowed to construct and renovate homes, non-Jewish homes during the nine days, if that's your job. A shul or a base medrash may be constructed or renovated during the nine days without restriction. Same thing also a, a roof, uh, a fence, a makia on your roof, which is a mitzvah, to prevent people from falling, God forbid, that you can also, of course, build during the nine days. Uh, a crumbling wall that might collapse, obviously there's no question about that, that you're allowed to, even if there's no danger of life, but it can cause you more money if it falls, you're certainly allowed to avoid that loss. Okay, that's no problem. Now, someone who experienced a miracle during the nine days, many years ago, and he wants to celebrate that day, on that day. So he says, you're allowed to, you should celebrate, make a, and, um, a, a, a suda for that anniversary and share the story and I'm bring about it. You should always do that. What happens if it falls out in the nine days? Definitely you should make a gathering and tell people about the miracle, which is a happy thing that we allow you to do, but no suda, no meal. Just uh, bring in without any, any, anything. Just tell the stories, inspiring stories of how you were saved. Okay. Now, it also includes not doing any laundry. It includes bed linens, even handkerchiefs and tablecloths should also not be laundered during the nine days. Uh, and you also cannot launder the clothing of a non-Jew in the week of Tisha B'Av. And this year, the week of Tisha B'Av is this whole week, coming up next week. Although some say there is no week of Tisha B'Av this year, but some argue, and therefore we're, not, we're, we're machmir to consider all the nine days the week of Tisha B'Av. Again, as I mentioned, there, there are some chumras, there are some stringencies that do not apply for most Kodesh, but when you get to the week of Tisha B'Av, for example, Tisha B'Av is on a Thursday, that whole week, even though it's uh, yeah, it's not Arab Tishabub, it's the week of Tishabub. You have to avoid uh, certain things that you would be allowed before that week started, even though it's already in the nine days. So if the nine days began on, let's say, on a, on a, on a Thursday, uh, that Thursday you might be allowed to do certain things. But once you get to Sunday, the week of Tishabub, you're not allowed to. This week, this year, this year, this year's calendar setting, we don't really have that distinction because Rosh Chodesh is going to be on Friday. So it's Chodesh anyways, for even nine days, that's it. And then you have the week of Tisha B'Av starting on Sunday. Um, okay, now, a few more halakhas, and we'll just get to interesting ones. Friday. Not this, uh, what's, today is what? Uh, yeah, it's Friday. So Thursday. Before, before Thursday, before Shkia, you should already have your clothing that you're going to wear in the nine days worn for a period of time, short period of time. You try them on, wear them for a, for a few minutes, take them off, wear them next. Whatever you're going to wear for the nine days, have it prepared before. Um, that's what I do. I wouldn't ask you to do that. That's, I'm not going to know what I'm going to wear for nine days straight. I'd rather throw it on the floor. <laughs> you can you know, take each day before, wear it for five minutes, take it off, and then it's not fresh anymore, and then you can wear it on nine days. Um, so it's either before or wear it? Or wear it, yeah. If you wear it even for a short period of time, it's counted as no longer no, no longer fresh. 
This is only for the, uh, the, uh, the, like the clothing you wear, the, uh, the, not the underclothing, it's the only the, the clothing you wear that are visible. Um, uh, one more interesting thing, we'll stop with this. Shabbos clothing, one should not wear Shabbos clothing during the nine days. In other words, even though we allow you to wear nice clothing, nice weekday clothing, as long as it's not 100% fresh, but you should not wear clothing that you only wear on a Shabbos or a Yantif or a Hasana, unless you're invited to a bris milah. You don't, you don't invite to a bris milah, but you attend a bris milah because you're a family member or a very close friend, and you're it's your simcha too. You're you happen to be, let's say, the, the um, either the moel or the uh, sanduk or some other person was given a very special keyboard. That person is allowed to dress up for that. And likewise, a bar mitzvah. Although you can't have any music, obviously, and no suda, you could have a bar mitzvah, kids saying a mimer, and then people that attend that, the family members that attend that bar mitzvah are allowed to dress up with Shabbos clothing. But ordinarily, you're not supposed to wear Shabbos clothing during the entire nine days, except for Shabbos, of course. Um, okay, so that's that. One more halacha concerning meat and wine. Children under six years old may eat meat and during the nine days. We don't, if they're below the age of chinuch, we don't trouble them with this halach. Um, I want to just mention, I'll mention on Thursday, actually. Thursday is uh, Rosh Chodesh. I'll talk about the fact that Aaron Cohen's passing is mentioned in this week's Sedra. Second part, Masay. And he passed away on Rosh Chodesh. Which Rosh Chodesh? Av. And why is it that Hashem made that Aaron Cohen should pass away on the first day of the nine days? There's a very interesting sikh from the Rebbe that explains the power of Aaron Akoin's Histalkos passing on the first day of the nine days. Anyone know that sikh? Familiar with that sikh? No? It's okay. What? I don't remember. Okay, let me share it with you just a short, a short word. Might as well tell it now. Um, what was this, what caused the Chorban Beis Amikdash? What what sin? The second one. Yes, sinas china, which is baseless hatred. What does baseless hatred mean? Not that you hate for no reason. You hate for no specific reason. I can't stand you because you are you and you're not me. I can't stand the idea that people give you credit for what you do. It takes away from my ego. You're interfering with my space by having your space. You didn't do anything wrong. It never hurt me. But the mere, mere fact that you exist and people look at you with respect takes away from the respect that I get. I don't like competition. That's called sinas chinam. You hate the person because that person is not you. Not for any specific reason. Okay. So that's the reason why we're in Golos now so long, but it's very a very hard sin to correct. Most people will say, I don't have that problem. Yeah, I do hate certain people, but I have a good reason for it. Uh, are you kidding? He did this, she did that. I don't hate people for no reason. For no, I hate people for specific reasons. I'm not like uh, so, you know, attached to myself that anybody who's not me, I can't stand. Oh, come on. I, uh, how would you think I would be? I'm, I'm never, I would never be like that. I would never uh, fall to that so far low. Uh, and many people fool, fool, fool themselves to think they don't have this ailment. They don't have this issue with sinas chino, but they do. You find reasons to hate the person. After you hate the person for no reason, because you can't stand that person, you'll find faults. But the faults was not the cause for your sino. Anyway, so that's the negative part. Aaron Akoin stood for what? Avas chinam. He loved everyone for no reason, just because you were Jewish. So he is the extreme opposite of sinas chinam. Aaron Akoin's energy is Baseless love, infinite love. That's why everyone loved him. He loved everyone else with a passion, so everyone loved him back. Reminds me of a story. I'll tell you in a second. Um, when a tzaddik passes away, what happens to the world? We don't lose him. We don't lose him maybe physically, but his energy becomes more exposed because there's no body anymore. So the energy of Abbas Chinom is explosive on which day? The day he passes away. Which day did our Aaron pass away? The first day of the nine days. 
leading up to Tisha B'Av. Hashem created, he always creates the refua, the cure, the remedy before he creates the problem and the sickness. If there's no refua, he would never punish us beforehand. So he created a Rosh Chodesh that Aaron Akoyin passes away on the Rosh Chodesh. And we know the Rosh Chodesh is not just the beginning of the, of the month, it's the head of the month. What does that mean, head of the month? Like a head of a human body, it's an organism which controls all the movements of your body. It governs, dictates every part of your, of your body. So Rosh Chodesh includes all the days of the month. In this case, Rosh Chodesh Av includes all the days of the month of Av, including Tisha B'Av. So the energy on Rosh Chodesh Av is the energy of Av Aschinam. Hashem made it that that love should erase baseless hatred and therefore remove the reason why we should be in Golas. Okay, now, I mentioned before that the Mimer is all about the power, not all about, but part we're learning right now is about the incredible power of speech. And here in this week's Parsha, we have vows, beginning of the Parsha, of the first part of a, of a uh, double Parsha, the double Parsha this week, 244, the longest laning of any Cedra. It's the longest laning, 244. It's about 60 or 70 Psukim more than the longest single Cedra. Very long. And I have to lane the Cedra so I know how long it is. Huh? I can't hear you. Call Yeah, yeah. Are you there? You're down there? Oh, okay. I can't hear you. I live there. In fact, in this week's part, it has a musical sound that only appears once in the entire Chumash. Two of them, and they come together. Only once in the entire all, all of the five Chumashim, Reish, Shmois, Vayikram, Amit, Bevorim, have what we call a Yerach, Ben Yoymai, Karni, I don't know if you'll notice it, but there's one truck there that goes wild. It's a very, very unusual musical sound. So it's a unique parsha, very long and interesting. And but the beginning talks about vows that you could actually make something trace. You can say on something that's kosher, let this apple be considered to me. You can't say it's pork. You say, let this apple be forbidden to me as if I would have sanctified it for carbon. I didn't, but it should be considered forbidden to me. This apple, I'm not allowed to eat. If you eat that apple, it's the same as eating cousin. But there's one major difference. Chazer can never be, doesn't become kosher. Unless the person is Nebuch, very sick, he can't eat it. Whereas a nether, a vow can be revoked, can be revoked. You go to a rabbi or three, three rabbi, a panel of three rabbis, and you say to them, if I only would have known the consequences, if I only would have known what trouble I'm getting myself into by making this vow. These consequences exist. I mean, the, the, the issues existed. I didn't realize these issues existed when I made this vow. If I would have known, I never would have made it. It was a mistake. The rabbis say, but that's the case. Mutralach, mutralach, mutralach. You are freed, you are released, you are released, you are released. Why do they say it three times? But interesting, the Sadducees, the Sadducees who didn't believe in the oral Torah did not believe that a vow can be revoked. Yes, they believed in the laws of vows. That's clearly a chumash. But the power to, for a panel of rabbis to annul a vow is not clear at all. It's very ambiguous. The Gemara says it's like a hair hanging in thin air. Very, very hard to find the source for it. It's ma mainly oral and not, not, not written anywhere. They denied it, and they didn't believe in it. Whenever we do something that the Sadducees, Sadducees rejected, we want to show them we don't, by, by making a chazaka of saying three times, we can do it, we can do it, we can do it. Just to show what we don't believe what you believe in. We stick to our rules. There's an oral law that, yes, uh, a rabbi, three, a panel of rabbis have the power to uh, revoke and, and nullify a vow that someone made. But here we see the power of speech. Power of speech could actually make something not kosher for yourself. It won't work if you think. If I said, I think I do not, yes, this is trafe. But you don't verbalize it, not going to be trafe. 
Only D word. So here's the connection to this week's parsha. There's a lot more to talk about concerning vows. Kipper, call me Dre, but I'm going to leave that for another time, maybe, or not. Okay, the mimer. That's the mimer down. Page 30, the first page. This is where we're up to. So the last thing we mentioned was the building, building up the weakness of the power of speech, how dependent, the dependency of speech on other faculties that we have. We mentioned earlier that what you speak, anything you say, you had to have thought about it before you speak. Speech is not meant for its own, it's not there for its own self. You don't speak just for the sake of speaking. You have to have a message. You don't have any a message of a heartfelt um, message, emotions. You want to convey a feeling to someone or you want to convey an idea to somebody, then you talk. If you have nothing to say, there's no content, and you still talk, you're not talking. You're not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not called speech. So speech is an absolute nakabo. It needs to receive for it to be itself. It has nothing on its own. It has no identity of its own. Last week we mentioned about emotions. Emotions also receive from intellect. Intellect triggers emotion. When you understand something, how something is so great, so powerful, so mighty, could either make you fear, or it can make you love, depending on what the, what the process of your, of your meditation was. But meditation influences a emotion. But even without the meditation, if I have natural you know, emotions that just, without thinking, are they not called emotions? Little children and the Havdal animals are very emotional and there's very little there. So we see emotions don't need seicho for them to be emotions. They need seichel to make them disciplined emotions. But for them to be who, what they are, they don't need an outsider for them, for, for them to be what they are. Emotions only need seichel to have a seichel mida, a seichel influence on the mida, but it, it can still act as a mida without seichel. It has something of its own. It has a content, an identity of its own. Whereas speech, without a content, without a message, is worthless. But then the Mimer went on further to say one more thing. And that was the footnote that we read. Footnote 52 was not only is the content of what you say, the general subject matter of what you're talking about, something you cannot say unless you thought about it before, but the exact choice of words that you use. There are many different words that can, can be used for the same idea. The fact you chose this word instead of that word, is also decided up there somewhere is in your brain. What part of your brain? So there's Chachma and there's Bina. Bina is responsible for the general idea of what you're trying to convey. Well, if you're trying to convey Hashem's leadership, so you'll say a word that, that expresses Hashem's mastery over the world. But why did you choose? There are two ways you could have said it. You could have said Adon Olam or Melech Olam. And we do say, Elokeinu melech olam sometimes, and we say Adon olam in the davening. So we see that even in our, our davening, we have both. Why did you choose right now to say Adon olam? In fact, yesterday, when you were talking about the same exact subject, you said melech olam. Why are you saying Adon olam? If you ask Bina, Bina will say, beats me. I wasn't trying to decide which word to use. I was just trying to get the general idea out. But why did you choose a specific Phrase Adon over Melech. And yesterday it was Melech over Adon. Where does that come from? Not from Dibur. It also nurses from somewhere. Where? From Chachma. Chachma is the subconscious part of your brain. It's very mysterious. It throws an idea in your head and you're like lost. Hey, what's this? I, I, you're like lost. You don't even know what, what it's all. You just know something came into your head that sounds right. You don't even know why it's right. It's like a, the light went on, but there's no, you have no words yet. And yet it's that power of Chachma that's 
kind of mysterious that answers the mystery. You know why you said Adon Olam and not Melech Olam? Chachma is that which produces letters and formation of words. Configuration, formation, it forms an exact container how to express your idea. What type of containers to put your idea in? Bina only expresses, Bina develops the idea, but it all originates from Chachma. Now, I want to, it's interesting. So in other words, what we're saying here is like this. When you have this flash, this pop-up flash in Chachma, you don't really feel anything. You don't feel, and you can explain it, you don't feel any words. In your, there are no words to, this, to express what actually came to mind. You're lost. You're in a trance. You see a light, but you can't break it down. There's no configuration. There's no dissecting or analyzing. It's all very general. Like you see a picture. You see the whole picture all at once. It's beautiful. But it takes time. Then you, then you start seeing details later on. So in Chachma, there are no details. Seemingly, there are no letters at all, period. But you know what? There are. You just don't feel it. Bina makes you feel what Chachma always had. Those letters that were in that were produced by Chachma, you don't get to feel those letters and be aware of it and sense it until you have the Bina experience. And there's a biological, uh, I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> it's chemistry. That Chassidus, the fourth Maimah here, the, the Rebbe Dashav, I once discussed this in a different class over the year, during the year. An interesting, uh, it's chemistry. You have water, fire, and oxygen. And what happens is if you take a pot of water, and you put the pot of water on the fire. Of course, there has to be oxygen in the room. Water also has oxygen, H2O, right? Hydrogen, oxygen. The fire also needs oxygen. So there's always oxygen. It's called air, H, Mayim. What about Afar? There's earth, there's dust particles in the water, but you can't see it. Just like there are letters in your chachma, but you can't see it. It's just one gigantic flash of light. Who can find letters at that level? I'm lost. So the example in chemistry is water is like Chachma, fire is Bina, and Das is the oxygen, is the air that allows the fire to extract from the water the dust particles. If you keep on boiling the water and you don't let it evaporate, you keep on pouring more water as it's about to evaporate, you add more water into the pot, the fire is constant for hours and hours and hours, you will see pieces of black stuff on the bottom of the pot. That black stuff is called Afar, the, sorry, the, the element of earth that was contained in the water, but it took the fire to extract it. So likewise, Bina is that which extracts. When you have an experience of Bina, then you find, oh, I can explain it. I have words, I have letters in my mind. But what power of your brain produced those letters, not what developed it, where is the production of those letters? What started start that production? Chachma. Chachma produces letters, although at that level you can't feel it. Chachma. Chachma. With the help of Das, Bina develops the letters that Chachma produced. Chachma is the source of why you say words the way you said it. But you don't even realize, at that point, when you have this Chachma experience, you have no idea what you're going to say at all at that point. But when you finally have this Bina experience, Bina develops and reveals those hidden oisias, hidden letters that were contained in the realm of Chachma. Another what he's saying here is, the fact you chose to say Adon Olam or Melech Olam is a mystery. And it takes the mysterious power of Chachma to produce that. Now, actually page 30, 30 is where we're up to. Yeah, the second paragraph. So it comes out like this. So again, he says, he starts a paragraph, so again. So again, speech contains no more than what it receives from the intellect through the language of thought. It has to first go through your thoughts. So speech, besides being a recipient, is not even a first-hand recipient, second-hand. 
If that's the case, it should follow that no additional insight and enlightenment could be attained through speech. It says in Hebrew, You would think it's impossible for there to be any additional insight after you speak that your words can actually give you a deeper level of understanding that you have that you had before you spoke. Because what you're saying is all derived from what you thought. And yet, what we see, as we'll soon explain, is that a person gains tremendously when a person puts his thoughts or her thoughts into words. Again, if that's the case, it would follow that no additional insight or enlightenment could be attained through speech that is not already present in the idea as it is in the brain. Since the brain is the source of all that speech reveals, you can't have more in the words than you have in its antecedent, in its cause. Yet we see an additional enlightenment of the concept when it is verbalized more than in its initial, initial stage of revelation as just demonstrated. We see that. And here he explains, the next paragraph begins with the difference of what happens to you when you speak versus before. When I say before, we mean right before. Even when you have whatever you're going to say clearly prepared in your word for word. Like when you have to speak on the radio, for example, you got to be sure you can't, your, your words are measured. You can't speak too long because you get cut off. You can't be too short because then you're going to be, it'll be uh, you know, awkward. You're going to finish before you're supposed to finish. So you have to time yourself and you have to really figure word for word what you're going to say. So it's clear you have your, your power of what I'm going to say in your mind. And yet, as soon as you open your mouth and you think as you speak, something happens, something major happens. And he's going to explain all the details in the next paragraph as to what happens. To explain the power of speech, every intellectual idea in Hebrew, that emerges from the source of intellect, that's called the Koach Hamaskil, appears in a measured and limited form. In its length, width, and depth. And number four, and particular mode of revelation. There are four changes that happen when you speak over verses before you spoke. One is called the width, one is called the length, one is called the depth. Actually, he starts with length here. But when he comes to explain it, he actually uh, explains the width first. Here's where he talks, here's where he starts. In other words, even if you felt, I can't explain this to a child. I can explain this to someone who really knows the material. Like someone who actually learned in the class where I was learning, I can explain it. Because that person has a background of knowledge. But to someone who has no background, I would be lost to try to explain this idea to that person. I mean, you got to know some kids for this. You can't explain this idea, these concepts to outsiders who have never learned a word of this. Um, I'd be lost to believe that I can explain it. Number two, what I know right now in my mind, yeah, I know the material right here. But for this material to answer five questions I had over the last six months, and I was learning in yeshiva, and I had many questions about yadus. And guess what? This little piece of the mimer just answers so many questions. I never would have thought that what I'm learning right now, as I'm thinking before I speak, that it could actually have ramifications. And I could actually look and delve into, hey, with this, I can answer that. And with that, I can answer that. I don't see all that. I don't see that, that, that broadness before I speak. And when you speak, all of a sudden, wow, this is not a small, this, wow, I can write a book on this now. It's not deeper. It's just broader and rich. So many details that you didn't notice before. That's what he says here. So we'll start with that. Because above but deeper, when it takes the form of speech, we see clearly that the idea expands immensely, far surpassing its prior state when it emerged from the intellect into the language of thought. In Hebrew, we see very clearly, tangibly, much more than before. What does before mean? 
So in the before, there are two levels. Before you speak, there are two stages in the before. Number one, the moment that the idea initiated in your thought, you weren't thinking what to say yet. It just, you're talking to yourself right now. You're thinking for yourself, whoa, wow, that's deep. Ah, I got it. Now, let me, let me try to explain it. Let me try to talk to someone else. So there are two levels of thought. The initial thought, that's pretty much private, and then the thought of what to say. And even the second stage of thought, the thought of what to say, you're still very limited. You don't feel you can really expand on this. That's what he's trying to say. So in, he, in English, it goes into two levels too. Um, when it emerged from the intellect into the language of thought, stage one, and stage two, and from there, continued on, ready to speak, before you speak. You're ready to speak right now. For then, at that stage, even stage two of the thought, it is constricted and confined within certain parameters. In Hebrew, in English back, but when it is verbalized, it expands immensely with many details and ramifications. You see details, and also you see how this can lead to other other concepts. This can answer many other questions that seemingly have nothing to do with this. When you first thought about it, what does that have to do with this? I mean, and all of a sudden, boom, things start to explode in your mind, incomparably surpassing its initial stage in the words of thought. That's the realm of, of broadness. Now we go to length. What does length mean? A line going down means not broader, the same concept, just as narrow, but more lucid. I can give a muscle, I can use an analogy. I can show, you know, for example, you learn Chassidus and no, by why what Jacobson does is very much. You learn a mimer, but then now apply it. Make it sound, like, talk to me. Give them a, a down to earth analogy in everyday life about what the mimer is saying. You don't feel you can do that when you're learning the subject before you actually speak. When you start speaking and you're thinking as you speak, you suddenly feel, hey, wait a second. I could, I could connect this to something that we experience in everyday, everyday life. I could connect this to relationships, to psychology. I didn't think I could. It was just a mimer. Now it's mimer, really, it's down to earth. I didn't see how down to earth it was when I first thought. As I speak, I see a length. Next paragraph. Similarly, when a person verbalizes an idea, he discovers several subjects to which the idea can be applied. I would say not subjects, but analogies, metaphors, examples. In Hebrew, you find many different ways of how to dress this idea to be more lucid, more, less abstract. In English, the idea can then be extracted and brought down from one level to the next until even one with limited understanding can grasp it. From one level to the next, in Hebrew, even a limited person, a person with limited in his intelligence can also understand it. Someone who's not used to thinking very deep, down-to-earth person, lives in the mundane world, and so that person says, yeah, I understand this mimer. You explained to me very well. Uh, had you not spoken, you were your that person would just hear your thoughts, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have understood anything. This is true that you become a much better teacher and you're much more clear, even if when he initially conceives the idea and brings it into the language of thought. And even stage two, when he considers how to express the idea, to and next page, page 31, to another, he does not find within himself the means with which to make it accessible to a person of limited understanding. In Hebrew, going back to the last words on the page, even at first, at first even in step two, stage two, even he's thinking of how to reveal it to another person. He has not found, he cannot find within himself the wherewithal 
or any kind of method which he can employ to explain this to a person who is on a lower, much lower level of intelligence. You're going to explain it to someone who's learned a lot, you know, an equal to yourself, someone who's basically a classmate or someone who's learned to see this. Yeah, for that person, I can explain it. But afterwards, he says, after that, what we see is when he verbalizes the concept, he discovers further strata of thought which the concept can be applied. Through this, the illumination contained within the concept descends. It descends. It goes down like a line going downward. That's why it's called length. This being the above mentioned length of the concept and becomes accessible even to one of limited understanding. So now we have two dimensions. It's broader. You can elaborate on it and expand and answer many questions you had in your life. And you could also make it much more lucid and much more down to earth. So that's the width. And the length. Now we go to the depth. The third thing with the next paragraph, but Ozo's furthermore depth. Speech causes him to discover a new insight that shed additional light upon the depth of the concept. Understanding is the it's basically the opposite of, of, of length. Instead of making it more simple, simplifying it, lowering the level, you can heighten it and make it deeper, more abstract, more profound. Than you first had it. So you understand it both in a more profound way and also in a more clear way. Both of them. And also broader. Again, furthermore, speech causes him to discover new insights that shed additional light upon the depth of the concept, which do not occur to him in the thought stage. In other words, when he ponders the concept in the language of thought, before it is verbalized, he does not at all know or conceive its depth as he does, as he does during speech, for it is only when that, only when that, the, the, for it is only then that the depth of the idea becomes apparent to him. Okay, we gave an example of what's called depth. The example of the famous halacha, but even if you're learning for the wrong reason, continue learning. I'm learning so I should get respect as someone who knows how to learn very well. I want to be rewarded. Whatever I want to have. I want to have wealth. I want to have pranasa. You know, if I learn a lot, I'll be a good teacher and so on and so forth. That's your motive. That's an ulterior motive. It's the wrong reason. You shouldn't learn for that reason. But if you can't help it, that's the only thing that motivates you to learn. So we say, you know what? Learn now for the ulterior motive and eventually you'll be learning for the right reason. That even a child can understand. Oh, you're telling me now it's bad, but later it's good. A child, you can explain that to a child. It's not so deep. Let's unleash a new layer of depth. No, it's not now versus later. Even now, there's a part of you that's learning for the right reason, which is, which is why we expect you in eventually to learn for the right reason. Eventually, we believe you're not going to have the ulterior motive. Why? Because even while you have this ulterior motive, there's a part of you deep down, in the depth of the Jewish heart, a Jewish soul is the, you know, the genuine... Uh, desire to learn because of Hashem's Torah, not because of any kind of reward. So not that we're, we're separating the time zone, present to future. While you are learning, there's two parts of you. Well, that's a little too deep for, for a child to understand. Children don't understand there's two parts of me. You know, I only know one part. It's not as easy to explain to a child that you could have the exterior and the interior of your neshama. The exterior part of your consciousness learns for, for this reason, and the interior learning for that reason. But then we go deeper. That's also pretty deep. How about taking the exterior and finding the interior within the exterior? How about taking the very ulterior motive, which is I want to become respected. I want people to respect me. I want to have respect, self-serving. I'm learning Torah to get honor. In that motivation, in that motive of I want the honor, what's really behind all that? I want the honor because it will make a Kiddush Hashem. You're not thinking that way, but the soul that's of that ulterior motive is also really holy. We gave the example of Baal Shemta, that when a person's hungry for food, it's your neshama hungry to elevate that spark. But you can't, we're not in line with our neshama, so we think it's just a physical hunger. So the actual hunger, expression of hunger, which is not holy, 
is a manifestation of the soul's hunger. The same thing, the kavana of Shalei Lushma is itself a whole. Now, only is the Jew holy and pure, but the actual motive, ulterior motive, is also pure. That is another layer of depth. It's the same concept. Learn now, Shalei Lushma, because there is Lushma. Is it later? Is it deeper in you? Or is it deeper in the ulterior motive? I'm giving you an example of what it means to learn something on three different levels. Not expanding it. I'm not making it easier. I'm, I'm, I'm on the contrary. I'm making it more abstract and more profound. Okay. I always use that example. There are other examples, of course. Any concept can be understood on different levels. Now, and that's why it's so important to, when you learn Torah, not to just sit and think, but rather to verbalize. One of the reasons why it's a mitzvah to uh, vocalize your learning, not to, to retain it in your thought, is because of this quality, that it, what it does to you. This is why he says, at first the Hebrew, This is why Torah study must study Torah aloud, as the verse says, and you shall speak of them. We say in the, in the Shema, Uchsev is also another interesting passage. It says, there's a passage that says, Pasuk <coughs> in, uh, in Mishli. Chaim Haim, Proverbs. Chaim Haim Lemoitze Ahem. The simple translation of those words are, life is to them who find the words of Torah. Lemoitze Ahem, like Metzia. Lemoitze Ahem to those that find Torah. Life is given to them. But the Gemara tries to take takes the word Lemoitze Ahem and says, Lemoitze Ahem to those that articulate, verbalize Torah. If you put your, if you take the thoughts of Torah and verbalize it, motzi, bring it out, it will give you life, a new level of life. Lemotzi am bepedafka. In English, the sages explain, what does it mean the words of Torah are life to that to he that finds them? Don't read finds. Motzi sounds like find. But rather read to he that articulates. Motzi. Motzi means like a multi lechem and the ones who extracts, uh, brings out, articulates with them with the mouth. For when one studies a given halacha aloud, he will develop new insights into the depth of that halacha that you would never have before. Insights that would not have occurred to him had he merely pondered the halacha in his mind without actually saying it. Then comes the fourth thing. Fourth thing is not deeper, not more lucid, not uh, broader, just different. Very often I ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. I'll try it now. Uh, listen to this question. How nervous. Okay. Um, who has more bittle? A tzaddik or a bainani? What do you say? See? <laughs> now, it's often that what you're saying, what you, if you think, before you actually say it, you might have said what she said, or maybe not. And you're both right. There's no, there's no wrong or right here. Depends what you mean by more bitul. And this is a, a sikh on the Rebbe about where is there more bitul? We had the base Hamikdash. There it says, you say in our davening in Musa, we can't bow anymore. Why not go bow? What's stopping you from bowing? You can't enter, but you can bow. What does bowing actually mean? To lose yourself completely. Your head is usually higher than your legs. When you bow and prostrate yourself, you're flat. We can't do that. We don't have that ability to be completely permeated with bittal. So there's more bittal with manhabayas. A tzaddik seems to have more bittal than a benedi. He doesn't even want to do anything wrong. He's not just bittal in his acts or in his, in his thoughts and speech, but his personality, his midas are, are also in line with Hashem. His intellect, every part of it, every fiber of his being is in touch with Hashem. So he has more, apparently. So that would be your answer. But the is not, not wrong either. Because it depends if we talk about quantity of bittal or quality of bittal. Quantity means how much of you is aligned with Hashem. How much of you does what Hashem wants naturally? 
by a tzaddik, much more, not just my action, everything, every part of me, every fiber of my being is in, is in sync with Hashem. Abenuni, internally, like a Rosha, but he has that ability to control his desires. So it's only outwardly that he's buckled. But what, why you're right, why you're, you have a very good point, the quality is greater because a tzaddik doesn't have to say no to himself. He's holy. He's a holy person. Holiness fits with holiness. There's no, I put myself aside for God. What God wants is what you naturally want. You're not putting anything aside. This is who you are. A tzaddik, for him not to be buckled is, is destructive. That would, be, that would be hurting himself. So a Bainini, or anyone lower than a Bainini, and does what Hashem wants him to do certain times, has Kabbalah soul, that's real bittle. Maybe it's not so permeating, but whatever little bittle you have, that's real. That's a great quality. You can actually say no to yourself. God, I say yes, but you say no. I give up. I surrender to you. I surrender my will to yours. That's giving yourself up. So real bittle. So here you see. Now, at times you might think, Tzadik. As you talk, no, Benini. And then you say, wait a second. It's not a, it's not a contradiction. Not a contradiction. It depends what you mean by Bittel. Is it Karmas or Echos? And they're both right. Yes, Chabot. How could, how could a Tzadik have Bittel if you don't, don't, don't in order to know that you're doing something, don't you have to have something existent? What do you mean? You mean to say that a tzaddik is a is pre-nullified. He worked on, he worked on therefore, himself. Therefore, he cannot nullify himself. Not anymore. Although it's not exactly that. true. There's there's still something. It says even a tzaddik who has a perfect, seemingly a perfect person, does have imperfections because his level of connection to Hashem is not the same as it was before he came down here in this world because of a body he has. Even when he has a love of Hashem, there's still some kind of self-expression there. So it's not perfect. Uh, so he has that to work on also. But he can also have one have, have to work on. I'll tell you a little story. I, know, I don't know what you're laughing at, but I'll tell you a little story. Um, <laughs> what's so funny? Someone sleeping? Uh -huh. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> why, why are you sitting so far by the table? Are you afraid of me? Why are you sitting so far away? It's more comfortable? What? Oh, it's comfortable, okay. But it's also more conducive to sleeping. Nothing. Um, what was I going to say? A um, story. What was the, what was the last thing you said before the story? Uh, uh huh? Oh, the other one said the following. The other one said, I have a taiva to say something against halacha because there's somebody who, whatever I say, he always says the opposite. He hates me. And whatever I say, he'll always say just the opposite. I would like to give that person the privilege for once in his lifetime to say something right. So let me say something wrong. And he will say something right. I have a very strong urge to do that, but I can't. Now, where does that urge come from? It's an after the kiss. His love for a fellow Jew, even a Jew who hates him. It's not an after Muhammad's love. The Rebbe doesn't have any desire to do anything, God forbid, against the lover. He has a desire to be mazaka, to give that person the privilege. But sometimes he can't listen to your Yetzir Toiv. A tzaddik has his Yetzir Toiv as his problem. Or another example. You know, so they can have issues with place and effort. They want to expire. They want to just leave this world. It's a holy uh, taiva. It's a, na a natural instinct of your natural kids to want to just leave everything. Not unholy, not self-serving. I mean, like a, an animalistic type of desire, but it's wrong. So tzaddikim in a way have a harder job than we have. We fight evil. They have to fight good. How could you fight good? Good is so good. You schmuck. To fight, not wanting to come close to Hashem, to have this incredible experience of leaving this world and having the bliss and the basking in the sunlight of godliness for us. So I think that would be the greatest pleasure. Giving that up is much harder than for us to give up garbage.
what we're giving up is you really think and you think a little deeper. It's not, it's not really that much. It just looks good, immediate gratification, but really it's pretty rotten and meaningless. A child has to give away something that's not meaningless. So in a way, he has a bigger, bigger fight. But it's still, when you talk about evil, in terms of going against Hashem's will, he doesn't have that, uh, you know, selfish desire of self-serving, meaning uh, bodily desires, mundane desires. He doesn't have to deal with that. So in, there he's in perfect alignment with Hashem in that respect. But you're asking what's his avoider? Yeah, he has plenty of avoider. has a lot of avoider. There's, and that when she will come, we'll have the future. You think it'll be boring when they have nothing to fight against? We'll go from good to more good to more good to endless good to infinite good, infinity. Now we're fighting with the you know with the negativity. Imagine learning. I'm going to still finish. Imagine if you're learning something and every word you have to look at the dictionary it takes time. How about not have, ha having everything clear, not having to need uh, you know looking up words, having the words written in. You know you have it written in, then you can delve into, into more into more interesting things. Torah is endless. So why have to grapple with a with translation of words when you can? Same thing. Good goodness is endless. I just gave you an example of a tzaddik in the Bainly. It's not a tzaddik about Tshuva, what's greater? You say the same question. Never sinned in his life. It's incredible. Never. Or he did and bounced back. That's more incredible. We don't know what, tzaddik, what happened to a tzaddik if he, would, if he would have faltered. We don't have any, any history of knowing if he would bounce back had he faltered. But on the other hand, who's more pure? Tzaddik. So you go back and forth. And you think before you speak, you might think this way. And then when you speak, suddenly it's that way. And then thirdly, you, you can see both ways. And then you start to say, you know what? They're not really contradictory. So that's what the next paragraph was about. You can see things differently. One last thing I want to mention here, what's interesting. When I was learning in a class, when I was a student, learning by Rabbi Zwiebel, brilliant genius of Chassidus, in the Marastown, Shiva. I was a bacher at that time. And he asked a very interesting question. Why did the mimer begin with, why is the last thing it's mentioned is depth? He starts with broadness, and then length, then he explains depth. Wouldn't depth be first? Isn't it true that the deeper you understand something, you'll have also more elaboration, and you could also bring it down first, better? If I understand something very deep, no, you don't agree with that? I mean, no, because I had so many professors in college who were brilliant, but for them to bring down a concept. No, no, but I'm saying, no you know what it takes to be able to give an analogy for, for an idea, you have to understand the idea deeper. Okay, true. You have to see things on every different, on different levels, you have to get to the core of the idea. So you would think that depth would be the first dimension he would mention, then he would mention uh, width and length. But he answered, no, he doesn't want to say that. Because if the mind would say that deeper affects the omek, the depth, you would think, oh, deeper only affects one dimension, depth. But once you understand it deeper, automatically you have also more analogies to give. So he wants to tell you, no, no, deeper has a direct effect on your ability to be lucid without the depth. It gives you a direct ability to find more analogies, and it also has an impact on your elaboration and also on the depth. But not that it causes only one thing, and that one thing causes the other two. Again, depth doesn't mean, no, what you're saying is a person who is, you know, people who are very uh, abstract, they have it more difficult to explain things. We're talking about someone who has a command over the idea, who reaches the core, that's, that's the real depth. You get to the core, like you're looking from uh, on, top, on top of the uh, of a building and you see everything. It becomes, you have a whole view. If I see the concept from the very start, I can see it on all different levels. I only have my one little you know, purview of the, of the concept. I can't see it on your life. I only see the way I see it. But that's the Kiddush. The Kiddush is that when you speak, it affects all three dimensions directly. Not it, not it affects your depth, and the depth affects the other two. Deeper affects all three, one on one. Then we'll talk about later on in the mimer. He's going to talk about the davening, but also about talk about midos. Still, now we're talking about intellect. What about what about emotions? We see that when a person is very very angry, what you haven't verbalized your anger, it's limited. As soon as you start saying why you're angry, you get even more angry. At times it's the opposite, but at times it's 
the anger, the words flare off the feeling of emotions to a different level completely. It's like it didn't exist. You wouldn't think it even existed. I, can't, how, I, I didn't think I can get this angry. I'm going out of my box. So words have a power to draw also from your emotions a much deeper level uh, of outpour of emotions that you would not think you would ever have. But works not only in intellect, works in, works in emotions. If deeper does all that, see, if deeper would only be something that works in intellect, but it wouldn't work in terms of your emotions, then I would have said, you know what? Maybe that's something to do with intellect. Maybe it's not this, don't give deeper credit. Something about intellect that when it's put it into words, somehow it, 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 it's enhanced. But since it works in every part of your every part of your of your system, it helps you emotionally and it helps you intellectually. So it must be there's something about deeper that does all this. And what, the question is, what is that? What is the secret of the power of speech that draws all this depth that you didn't have before? Um, see you on Thursday, Mr. Shen. Answer the question we asked today also about God this one was in English. Better late than ever. So better late than ever. Your presence is always appreciated. Want to hear back the comments? So funny. Like what? I want to laugh too. I also want to laugh. What? Huh? We always laugh. What? What's? But what are you laughing at? Okay. It certainly means. What? I'm glad she's here. What? I'm glad that she's here. I told her. One thing is for sure that while you were laughing, you weren't really focusing. That's for sure. Good night. Thank you.